Simon Magus was a notorious magician of the first century and has been credited with founding a branch of Christian Gnosticism. He was apparently born in Gitta, a village of biblical Samaria. The Book of Acts in the New Testament tells of the amazement of the Samaritans with his sorcery. Simon's followers called him the power of God which is called Great, or the Great Power. In Acts we read, they followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized. And he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers that they might receive the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, May your money perish with you, because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry, because your heart is not right before God. Simon's later Christian enemies, such as Eusebius and Justin Martyr, had no problem believing his sorcerous powers, as it confirmed their notions of demonic intercession, and Simon exemplified the sorcery that could be channeled through one in consort with a demon. Typical of the early Christian writers, anything they disagreed with had to be the spawn of evil demons or the workings of the devil. There is a doubtful 3rd century legend that relates the story of Simon's death as a result of a combative magical exchange between Simon and St. Peter. At the Roman Forum, Simon Magus challenges St. Peter before the Emperor Nero. At this time, Simon and Peter were both in the city, promulgating their different doctrines. Simon sought to demonstrate his spiritual superiority by ascending into flight, and Simon was taken up many feet into the air, and St. Peter, witnessing this, cries out for the invisible powers to release their hold on Simon. The apparent evil spirits at once obeyed the pious saint, and Simon fell to his death, thereby proving to some later Christians the saint's superiority. But far earlier than the fable of this combative exchange, indeed as early as we look back in civilization, magic, religion, and science coexisted. Some scholars suggest magic preceded religion as much as religion preceded science. This, of course, is an oversimplification, but it points to an earlier role for magic with good reason. The civilizations of antiquity believed in invisible, intangible energies, disembodied spirits, and ghosts. And for all who believed in magic, possessed a variety of methods to encourage magical forces or deities to work in their favor, and to work against those spirits or demons that may come to cause harm in the form of disease, mental insanity, or the sexual consumption of a victim's energy. Seeing the universe from a foundation of spiritual belief encourages the believer to populate the unseen realms with dangerous or beneficent powers. Magic in this way is a natural operation in a spiritual reality. This belief, when not kept in check, can and did lead to implausible superstitions. But we should not think the Babylonians, Egyptians, and Persians did not also have good reason to believe what they did. And depending on your own experience with what some may deem supernatural or otherworldly, colored how palatable the notions of magic were to you. Very credible people tell the most extraordinary stories of heightened states of being and visions during meditation or yogic practice, which we would doubt far more if we have an experience similar and unexplainable states. It is convenient to the disbeliever and requires little effort to dismiss magic in all things mystical, as much as it is convenient for the believer to grant any story they hear as truth without investigation. 
Prayer itself can be seen as a form of magic, in that some prayers are directly attached to an outcome, and to pray should imply a belief that the prayer has an effect. And magic, more than religion, often introduces immoral and selfish aims of a client or a practitioner, because magic implies a control over unseen forces, a binding and directing of them to an exact end. In this way, an evil prayer that might qualify as a curse against someone is not a prayer at all, but an instance of attempted black magic. And for prayers not attached to an outcome still imply greater spiritual forces at work, powers that can be called upon for guidance, healing, or simply connected with to bring one into a rapport with a better state of being or in rapport with a specific divinity whose presiding skill or role might immediately benefit the practitioner. And there are plenty of fascinating accounts of answered prayers throughout history and today, just as there are accounts of ancient magical practices affecting the material world. In modern times, we have the oversimplistic but not at all useless separation of white and black magic. Black magic, or sorcery, often implies that an external source of energy whether a daemon or spirit or god or another human or animal, is seized, harnessed, or harvested and made to do the selfish bidding of a practitioner. Self-sacrificing one's own energy can also be a kind of black magic depending on the practitioner's intention. White magic could be simplified by defining it as magic that redirects natural forces of the spirit or energies of the body to complete a task. White magic might operate on an emotional rapport between two individuals, say, lovers at a distance with no means of physical communication. A white magician can employ a formula that necessarily exploits the mutual bond of love as a kind of energetic bridge that allows the intended message to travel from one place to the other without any negative consequence. We hear, for instance, in war times of mothers feeling an immense grief and despair at the same time they later learned their sons died in battle. We could imagine that the bridge in magic functions along the same lines. Magic is subject to unfair criticism from those who do not believe in some of the fundamentals of parapsychology that would have to be in effect in order for magical practices to be real, namely, love magic could not ever function without the existence of telepathy or telepathy. Many miracles performed by any number of prophets or divine figures throughout history imply the powers of telekinesis, from walking on water to calming a storm. To believe in these miracles from any religious figure necessarily implies a belief in some degree of magic in nature. In antiquity, there was a strong perceived connectivity with deities and their statues. In Philostratus's Life of Apollonius of Tiana, we hear of people torturing statues of the gods or dragging them through the streets in order to make them do the people's bidding. And from ancient Egypt, we hear legends of the priests causing statues of the gods to speak as if they were the very abodes of the deities. A vital aspect of ancient magic called cosmic sympathy was classified by the Stoic Posidonius of Apamea. This concept was that one event at any point in the universe could affect another event, no matter the distance or the difference of the two. This could be seen as a prerequisite, a principle in order for magic and, of course, astrology to function. This sympathetic magic functions within the principles of similarity, contact, and opposites or antipathy. We can immediately see how a belief in these concepts enriches the unseen but presumably felt presences in our daily life and attaches them to outside events, or vice versa. If we are experiencing a certain emotion or thought pattern and the outside world delivers a similar manifestation of this expression, the magical connection between the two could be readily implied. Magic therefore navigates the fine lines between meaningful synchronicities that appear to have their root in cause and effect. But a synopsis of Greco-Roman magic is incomplete without accounting for its Near Eastern influences. But these influences have to be reserved for an essay of their own. Nonetheless, the magicians of most civilizations 
Whether they be the Hittites, Egyptians, Sumerians, and Akkadians, were often of an elite and priestly caste. And we can see how among this class the transmission of esoteric magical formula was prevalent. Greco-Roman magic necessarily relates to the post-classical influence of the multicultural melting pots like the city of Alexandria, center points of foreign civilizations such as these, especially those containing foreign religious teachings translated in the native tongue of the city, impacted the later understandings of magic around the Mediterranean and on through the Middle Ages. After all, if you discovered that the Magi of Persia, the initiates of Egypt, and the wise men of Babylon were involving similar magical practices and objects in their devotions, it counted as a testament to the validity of a magical universe as a whole, and totems, amulets, and counterspells became a commonplace. Thus, it is no surprise that Greek writers so frequently relied on the writings of foreign wise men to stamp home their theological or magical arguments. One instance of this is Apuleius, a Platonist of the second century AD. When accused of working black magic, he defends himself by correcting his accusers on what a magus actually was. And his full account demonstrates how people of his intellectual class perceived magic at the time. What is a magus? asks Apuleius. I have read in many books that magus is the same thing as priest in our language. What crime is there in being a priest and in having acquired an accurate knowledge, a science, a technique of traditional ritual, sacred rites, and theology, if magic consists of what Plato interprets as the cult of the gods when he talks of the disciplines taught to the crown prince in Persia? There is no responsible way to discuss Greco-Roman magic without taking account of our literary sources. And Homer's Odyssey, presumably written in the 9th or 8th century BC, is the first known Greek text that mentions a magical operation. That is, when the beautiful sorceress Circe drugs some of Odysseus's companions and turns them into swine. In Homer we find that precursor archetype as well of the deceptive witch in the woods. In a clearing in the woodland glen they discovered the house of Circe. It was well protected, put together with well-polished stones. All around it were mountain wolves and lions. She bewitched them by giving them evil drugs. And so the group of men on shore heard Circe singing beautifully within, and they called out to her. She invites them in, and only one companion of Odysseus, Eurylochus, stays back and returns to the ship to tell the tragedy to the rest of the crew. Odysseus slung his bronze sword and his bow across his shoulders and bid Eurylochus to lead him to the witch. I left the ship in shore. As I went through the awesome woods and was approaching the great house of the sorceress Circe, Hermes with the golden rod met me as I came close to the house, looking like an adolescent in the flower of manhood, with a new-grown beard. He took my hand, spoke my name, and said to me, Where are you going, my poor friend, through the wild woods, all by yourself, not knowing the place? Your companions move around in Circe's house, looking like swine, crowding into her pig pens. Are you going there to set them free? I tell you, you will not come back. You will stay there with the others. But look, I will help you and rescue you from your troubles. Here, take this fine medicine. And so the superior Olympian god Hermes gives Odysseus Molly, a magical herb and antidote and he gives him all the instructions needed to defeat Circe. Odysseus then calls out to the sorceress, gains entrance, and when he is made to sit down and drink her potion, he is unbewitched. Not knowing this, she strikes him with her wand and bids him lay down with the other pigs. But Odysseus draws his sword and springs for her. Circe then throws herself at his feet in submission, amazed he is not harmed by her spell, and she says, you must be the resourceful Odysseus. The Argus killer with the golden staff has always told me that you would come here from Troy on a fast black ship. And she asks him, please, to sheathe his sword so they can make love and learn to trust each other. And Odysseus, swayed by her beauty, concedes to her bed only after she vows no further mischief against him or his crew. 
This passage sets forth much of the preceding understanding of how magic may have been perceived in the early Greek world, and it certainly reinforces the idea that the friends of Hermes can be protected from sorcery. Hermes, therefore, employed counter magic against Circe, and also predicted the arrival of Odysseus. This story provides three essentials that would resurface in later magical myths. One, a magical object such as Circe's wand. Two, a magical antidote or herb. And three, a deity or divine personality capable of providing counter magical instructions or gifts of protection. Within the writings of the so-called Corpus Hippocraticum, dated to the late 5th or early 4th century BC, there is a lengthy passage condemning the shamanic treatment, or rather maltreatment, of epilepsy. And this unknown author demonstrates his perception of these charlatans, saying, they hide behind the idea of the divine and disguise the fact that they have nothing with which to fight the disease and bring relief. And later, they pretend to know how to draw down the moon, to eclipse the sun, to make storm and sunshine, to bring rain and droughts, to make the sea impassable and the earth sterile, and other things like this. The ones who know about such things will tell you that such effects can be achieved through certain rites or some other skill or operation. Thus we could surmise, not only by the passages in Homer and other early writings, that there were certainly a variety of miracle workers and magicians at hand in the Greek mind, and when we recall the tales of the mythic and magical Orpheus and glance at the fragmentary writings of his followers, we can also gain insight into the early beliefs around magical operations. We know the gods and goddesses wore magical helmets and armor, carried magical devices, much like the golden rod of Hermes, said to be able to rouse men from sleep and to bring them to a slumber. Pythagoras as well, living in the 6th century BC, was attributed with many magical dealings, as is shown in the biographies written by Iamblichus, Diogenes, and Porphyry. Pythagoras was apparently seen in the same hour in two distant cities. He could speak with animals, as in the story of the eagle permitting him to stroke it. A river greeted him once, saying, Hail Pythagoras! And he also predicted that a dead man would be found on a ship entering a harbor. The philosopher Empedocles, living in the 5th century BC, and a later adherent of the teachings of Pythagoras and Anaxagoras, was also rather romantically attributed with powers later associated with miracle workers and magi. Empedocles healed the sick and restored youth and elders, and is said to have had the capacity to influence weather and summon the dead. And even King Solomon of Israel was said by Josephus, the Jewish historian, to have been given certain magical abilities. Josephus wrote, God gave him knowledge of the art that is used against daemons in order to heal and benefit men. This quote bears clear resemblance to the so-called apocryphal book, The Wisdom of Solomon, perhaps composed in the first century BC, where Solomon apparently says that God gave me true knowledge of things as they are, an understanding of the structure of the world and the way in which elements work, the beginning and the end of eras and what lies in between, the cycles of the years and the constellations, the thoughts of men, the power of spirits, the virtue of roots. I learned it all, secret or manifest. And in Josephus's day, in the first century AD, there also lived Pliny the Elder, a historian, natural philosopher, personal friend of Emperor Nero, and an army commander in the Roman Empire. In his work, Natural History, Pliny gives a rather exhaustive account of contemporary superstitions and magical beliefs at a most crucial moment in history. He writes, Many believe that by charms pottery can be crushed, and not a few even serpents, that these themselves can break the spell, this being the only kind of intelligence they possess, and by the charms of the Marcy they are gathered together even when asleep at night. On walls too are written prayers to avert fires, Homer said that by a magic formula, Ulysses stayed the hemorrhage from his wounded thigh. Lucius Piso, in the first book of his Annals, tells us that King Tullus Hostilius used the same sacrificial ritual as Numa, which he found in Numa's books, in an attempt to draw Jupiter down from the sky, 
and was struck by lightning because he made certain mistakes in the ceremony. Many indeed assure us that by words, the destinies and omens of mighty events are changed. But earlier than Pliny are many other writers that give us a differentiation between the superstitious and the wise. Theophrastus, living in the later 4th and early 3rd centuries BC, who succeeded Aristotle as head of the Athenian school, gives us a portrait of the superstitious person in his work Characters. He writes in the lengthy review of such a personality that, whenever he has had a dream, he will consult the interpreters of dreams, the seers, the augurs, to find out to which god, to which goddess he ought to pray. He will also go to the Orphic priests in order to be initiated. Aesop, too, the at times legendary writer of the 5th and 4th centuries BC, attributed with the authoring of many fables, also engages in a satirical critique of the superstitious and the charlatan in one of his fables about a sorceress who was paid well for her many incantations, but was later condemned to death. And some who saw the woman being led away shouted, Poor woman, you claim to be able to avert the anger of the higher powers. How was it that you cannot even persuade mere mortals? There is an interesting dramatization by Sophocles, the 5th century BC, of Heracles' death through a form of love magic in the work The Women of Trachis. The wife of Heracles, Deanira, was taken across a river by a centaur. Heracles shot the centaur with a poisoned arrow when the creature tried to make love with his wife. The centaur, while he was dying, convinced Deanira to take some of his blood, as it contained a powerful love charm that could be used whenever she thought Heracles had been unfaithful. Using this deceptive love charm, she ends up killing her husband. But this is only one version of the story. In another version, Deanira's nurse tries to help her restore Heracles' love for her, and the nurse says something quite relevant. I once ordered a landscape to bloom in the middle of winter. I have stopped a thunderbolt in its flight. I have shaken the sea, though there was no wind, and smoothed the stormy ocean. When I begin my chance, the laws of nature lose their power. And there is more than the laws of nature that magicians of antiquity professed to be able to affect. Life and death were not beyond the powers of a sorcerer's control, and there were times when politics and magic crossed paths with very serious implications. One example of this is given in the Annals, written by Tacitus, one of Rome's greatest historians born in 56 AD. For in 19 AD in Antioch, following the strange death of Julius Caesar Germanicus, an adopted son of Emperor Tiberius, Germanicus's residence was searched, and the workmen found, underneath his floor and between the walls, objects of definite black magic, placed and created with the intent to take down Germanicus. And as he lay dying, Germanicus expressed that he believed two of his enemies, a governor of Syria and his wife, were responsible for poisoning him with a sorcerous concoction. Quote, under the floors and between the walls of the house, the remains of human bodies were found and dug up. There were also spells and curses and lead tablets with the name Germanicus engraved, and furthermore, half-burned ashes smeared with blood and other tools of evil magic. The perpetrators were later persecuted, and the governor took his own life, and his wife did the same not long afterwards. But cursed tablets were not always directed to human beings alone. There was an African cursed tablet of the 3rd century AD discovered that sought to bring down two teams of charioteers during a chariot race, which were widely popular at this period in the Roman Empire. And we glimpse in this example the kind of sorcery for hire that was available throughout the empire, and very much legitimate in the mind of both the practitioner and the paying client. When serious money is being gambled or invested in the races, working black magic is an added assurance to boost the chances of your favored chariot. The tablet reads, I conjure you, Damon, whoever you may be, and order you to torture and kill from this hour, this day, this moment, the horses of the green and white teams. Kill and smash the charioteers Clarus, Felix, 
Primulus, Romanus. Do not leave a breath in them. I assure you by him who has delivered you, at the time, the god of the sea and the air. And in the Greek magical papyri, which is a collection of Greek, Demotic, and Coptic texts dating from the 2nd century BC to the 5th century AD, there is another odd spell for wrecking chariots that reads, Burn garlic and a snake's slow as an offering, and write on the tin plaque, Nebuto Sualeth, Biu Erbeth, Pakerbeth, and Anuf. Overturn him and his companions. Bury the tablet for three days in the grave of someone who died untimely. He will come to life for as long as it stays there. Also from this period of the Roman Empire comes a tale of sorcery worked against one of history's favorite and most esoteric philosophers, Plotinus, born and raised in Egypt and given by modern scholars as the founder of Neoplatonism. Porphyry, a later Neoplatonist who wrote The Life of Plotinus, gives an account of a magical exchange between Plotinus and a contemporary. This enemy philosopher, Olympius of Alexandria, was envious of the superiority of Plotinus's intellect and tried on numerous occasions to work black magic spells against him, particularly directing star rays against Plotinus. Porphyry wrote, Olympius's scheming went so far that he even attempted to direct, through magical operations, the evil influences of stars on Plotinus, but he realized that his attempts fell back on himself, and he said to his friends that psychic powers of Plotinus were so strong that the attacks of those who wished to hurt him rebounded on themselves. And Plotinus could tell when Olympius worked sorcery against him, and said that his body had felt at the same time like a purse whose strings had just been pulled together. And such operations were not out of Plotinus's wheelhouse of understanding, as he shows in his Aeneads a complete knowledge of magic, writing, quote, in nature, there is an agreement of like forces and an opposition of unlike, and a diversity of those multitudinous powers which converge in the one living universe. In magic there is much drawing and spell binding, dependent on no interfering machination. The true magic is internal to the all, its attractions and, not less, its repulsions. The magician, too, draws on these patterns of power, and by ranging himself also into the pattern, is able tranquilly to possess himself of these forces with whose nature and purpose he has become identified. Supposing the mage to stand outside the all, his evocations and invocations would no longer avail to draw up or to call down. But as things are, he operates from no outside stand ground. He pulls, knowing the pull of everything towards any other thing in the living system. In Greco-Roman magic, there were many spells that relied on daemons, literally divine beings, to act out in operation. Some spells existed to attract a daemon for this very purpose. A spell might bind a daemon to a deed, like sending a dream to a target or sending a message. And we see from the magical papyrus in Leiden a dream spell from Zeminus of Tentyra that threatens the daemon if it refuses to do the practitioner's bidding. After a lengthy preparation, the spell ends with, quote, if you do not listen to me and refuse to go to, insert name, I will tell the great god and he will spear you through and chop you up, member by member, and feed your flesh to the mangy dog that lives among the dung heaps. For this reason, listen to me now, now, quickly, so I won't have to tell you a second time. Another spell for driving out and expelling daemons calls on the god of Abraham, and even Jesus, saying, quote, Hail, God of Abraham, hail, God of Isaac, hail, God of Jacob, Jesus Christos, the Holy Spirit, the Son of the Father, who is above the seven, who is within the seven. Bring Io Sebaoth, may your power issue forth from him, insert name, until you drive away this unclean daimon, Satan, who is in him. And later, come out, daimon, wherever you are, and stay away from him, Insert name, now, now, immediately, immediately. Come out, Daimon, since I bind you with unbreakable adamantine fetters, 
and I deliver you into the black chaos and perdition. And it's no surprise that Jesus' name was called on, among other gods and personalities, to drive out demons, considering Jesus, as is told in the book of Mark, expels the demons from a possessed man, that is, only after he calms a storm, much like the other purported miracle workers of antiquity who had a magical effect on the weather. Jesus had just been lecturing from a boat on a lake to an audience, and when evening came, quote, a furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. And in Mark 5, we read, Quote, When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs. No one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission, and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about two thousand in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. And finally, we turn to the famous and legendary contemporary of Jesus, Apollonius of Tiana, whose biography was written by Philostratus in the 3rd century AD. Much like Apollonius's master, Pythagoras, long before him, Apollonius is credited with many miracles, telepathic divinations, and on more than one occasion, he combats evil spirits with powers of his own. On a road to India in the Caucasus, Apollonius and his party became the target of a vampire, a kind of insubstantial phantom, and at Apollonius' instruction, they all rebuke and counterattack the vampire until it takes flight. In Athens, where Apollonius gave many lectures, one particularly shameless youth, who had made a name for himself by being obnoxious, was present and making a fuss, and Apollonius announced that the boy is possessed by a demon. Apollonius looks the demon in the eyes through the boy and the demon whirls in fear. Apollonius, however, asks the demon to prove he will take flight from the boy, and so the demon knocks over a column by the agora to prove he is gone, and the dispossessed youth rubs his eyes as if waking up and never carried on like he once did, much like the dispossessed man in the story of Jesus by the lake never again became the target of any legion of demons. While Apollonius was in Rome under the reign of Emperor Nero, there was an eclipse and Apollonius predicted something momentous will happen and not happen, and within days, lightning struck the cup Nero was holding up to his lips, but the emperor did not die. Indeed, it was Emperor Domitian who later died by assassination that Apollonius, rather than predicting the emperor's demise, actually seems to experience it at the very moment while he is giving a lecture among the trees in Ephesus. Suddenly, Apollonius lowers his voice and falls silent, staring hard at the ground, his listeners murmuring in confusion. Stepping four paces forward, Apollonius shouts, Strike the tyrant! Strike! As if seeing the assassination play out in his mind. Apollonius explained what happened, telling them all the tyrant was dead, swearing by Athena, the goddess of war. Many didn't believe until news spread from Rome that on the very same day and hour as Apollonius's vision, the emperor was assassinated. 
And so, the combative magic of the Greco-Roman states is replete with such tales of driving off demons and defending oneself against evil spirits. Cursed tablets and violent spells were ubiquitous, much as the evil eye was ubiquitous in antiquity. The evil eye was a belief in a magical effect brought on by an evil glance, and there were and still are many amulets and protective garments or items that are said to protect one against this evil. The first literary account for the effects of an evil eye appeared to have been given by the Greek poet and author of the Argonautica, Apollonius of Rhodes. In a world so filled with mystery and wonder, the modern culture can at times excel in forgetting about it all. But we should remember the great tales of the ancient world, especially when they offer us a condensed version of thousands of years of experience. Magic being a very strong experience in human memory, which hasn't simply disappeared with secular society. In fact, the term synchronicity, which received great study by the psychologist Carl Jung, is a frequently experienced account of the mystical and perhaps magical in everyday life. Synchronicity is defined as the simultaneous occurrence of events which appear significantly related but have no discernible causal connection. This experience ranges from thinking about someone moments before you see them at the market, or dreaming about a person you haven't seen for decades, only to wake up with a message from them. There are so many. And while I don't credit myself with any power over the natural forces of the world, I have had countless experiences of these meaningful synchronicities that have humbled me in the face of the great mystery. One experience, which happened on two occasions, left me so jarred I didn't tell anyone about it for many months. I was at a stage of life where I wanted little to do with the usual nights out with friends, sneaking about for a thrill, and instead wanted to be back home in the woods reading a good book. And one particular night, while I was leaving a house party by the ocean in Virginia, somewhat disillusioned by my company but feeling an internal wonder take a hold of me, I looked up to the stars, hands in my pockets, and I thought, show me a shooting star. And within five seconds, there it was, a trailing fragment from the cosmos, burning up in the atmosphere. Now when it happens once, you can at least convince yourself you were just seeing things, but when it happens twice, you begin losing the words. Some of these ancient texts have helped me find the words and the wonder again. And so, knowing our reality is to some degree crafted by our internal thought, if the world ever gives you the evil eye, if the daemons ever come for you, make like King Solomon, Jesus of Nazareth, or Apollonius of Tiana, and drive them far away.